clearly the view of networking that is held today is very different from the one that we had back in the, the late 60s and early 1970s when we were first contemplating on just linking networks at all. And our goal was how do we get a packet from here to one packet, not, you know. Uh, if we knew then what you know now, how would you have recommended we get started back then, other than to do what we did? <laughs> the, the really great thing about the, the split of functionality in, in TCP IP, not in the original NCP, but certainly when, when you made the changes and, and split things out into TCP and IP, is that it created a network which is a really good general purpose network. It's really quite poor to do any specific task, but it's a really good general purpose network. And that, I think, has been its main success story, is because it, you, you could not possibly have foreseen all the uses that it would be put to. And so what you managed to do, whether by genius or serendipity, I don't know, um, was to produce a network which was future-proof, um, but not optimal. And it turns out, I think, with hindsight, that being future-proof but not optimal is much better than being optimal but not future-proof. Um, and so I think if you had done very much different, it probably wouldn't have succeeded. Um, the, the, that ability to just treat everything as packets and push the reliability up to TCP enabled us to then run other things over it, like video or things like that. It made it very future-proof. Um, I think the big weaknesses are ones which we've known for a long time, and they're primarily in the area of security. Um, but security and functionality are always competing. And so if you'd paid too much attention to security early on, again, it might not have actually been rolled out. So I think the, the, it would, the thing I would have, with hindsight, done differently is to start to pay a little bit more attention to the concept of security. But it simply wasn't on the, on the goals then. Well, you know, I, w I would just add the following, and, and then I want to get it back to Peter. That's, this, is, this is about Peter today. Um, but security was actually very much uppermost on our mind when we started. And I was actually in charge of the security part of that, among other things. And the problem was in, I mean, other than what you would consider privacy, which is kind of something you might do by encrypting, and something that is considered security from the point of view of, let's say, a military establishment. Those are very different things, and they worry about very different kinds of problems. And at that point in time, and I would date this to probably the early 1970, 1973 timeframe, uh, the security establishment in the United States had an enormous set of issues they were dealing with and not enough personnel to work on them. And along shows up a young kid, namely me, and, and we're talking about the need for security on these futuristic networks called packet switch networks, which they didn't even really think may be viable going forward. To actually divert a large part of the resource to dealing with security it was a non-starter. I mean, the view was wait until we can see that it's real, that there are people who want to make use of it, then we'll go worry about putting in the resources. And again, we were dealing with universities for the most part, research establishments, who basically had no ability to provide real security because it would have meant, you know, security seven, seven by 24, I mean, every, every hour of every day, security guards, I mean, you wouldn't have that in any university in, in the United States and almost surely not here either. So it, it was not for lack of interest, not for lack of awareness, it was for lack of ability to proceed then just based on the practicality of all, it didn't seem real. And, and once it did, it was even more difficult because then you had the competing demands of national security and, and law enforcement versus the needs of the private sector for privacy and, on their own right. So I actually, I have a question which I have addressed to Peter, uh, but also to Bob, which, which is a much higher level question, so non well, semi-technical question, which is there was a, some kind of combination of circumstance which led agencies that thought about long-term research that had legs, you know, really 50 years is pretty impressive for a research program. Um, now, Peter alluded to some of the agencies, the funding agencies, uh, being against this kind of work, you know, being an obstacle, and yet he succeeded in you know, overcoming that, this side of the pond. But 
Um, is there any advice that you could both offer in how we might think about how research at funding agencies and institutions that go together with them can actually get away from short-termism and, and succeed in a way that, that your programs of work have succeeded? It's, there are other examples from, from ARPA that you know, most of the self-driving car hype actually comes from an ARPA program in, in, you know, in, in that the, the may lead somewhere as well. Um, maybe 50 years' time, we'll see that, you know, it wouldn't be everywhere. But, you know, there's, there's something about the, yeah, so Peter, could you say something about how the, you know, the, the obstacles were overcome? And could we, could we repeat that success somehow in other areas? Well, the easiest way to repeat, of course, there are still parts of the world which are not, are not reached, those at least can be reached, and that's one of the things. But uh, my experience is if you can only keep the number of people involved in any decision-making small, <laughs> then you have a chance. As soon as you start having lots of people involved, it becomes almost impossible to make any progress whatsoever. And I don't know what else to say on the subject. It's just terribly difficult if there are lots of people involved. Right, I think we can all we can all chime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, so you, what am I going to put on that? Yes. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, so uh, let me approach it from several different ways. First of all, in the U.S., we had a very different kind of situation than you had over here. Um, in the U.S., if I had to convince other people about the value of internetworking, we probably would have failed. Because it wasn't understood, and this was like, this was like a field of dreams. Why, why would you build an internet? Well, there was no p particular problem we were solving. It was a scientific challenge. Uh, P Peter called it an experiment. Um, it's still today, in some sense, a grand experiment we would not have succeeded. The only reason it went forward, I believe, is because I had the budget in my budget. And therefore, in order to actually act on it, putting out money, funding different places, including one contract we gave with UCL to participate, uh, it would not have happened. So that, that was a very different situation on the US side. We had an organization, it was called DARPA at the time, formerly ARPA, but it had the ability to just proceed with these things because it had the charter to be able to do these things. As I saw the situation over here, and I, and I saw it from some personal interactions and also through the eyes of Peter as he explained it to me at the time, was there was no central equivalent to that over here. And for the most part, Peter was the moving force. And you know, when I look at what he accomplished in his career. I mean, people don't get on the ARPANET or the internet, certainly ARPANET's not around, but they don't get on the internet because they have a fierce desire to use TCP or a desire to use, uh, I don't know, DTCP or whatever the other protocols are. They, they get on it because they want a certain service and it's an interaction usually with some other party, person, or, or service elsewhere. That's what Peter made happen. Peter was, I think, from my perspective, more than anyone responsible for getting the international dimension for this real. And once you established it, it became a simpler matter to extend it elsewhere. Um, the National Science Foundation in the U.S. played a major role in expanding it. DARPA was more constrained on the U.S. But we had originally the clear notion that international participation was important. And Peter's activity was the main connection that we used. And Peter really, I mean, he almost played the role of a carrier, uh, a PTT, if you will, here in, in Europe on behalf of not only what happened in, in Britain, but elsewhere. I mean, conversations elsewhere and the like. And I mean, there was a lot of discussion about the satellite linking, but that was really caused by oh, the need to work around some of the constraints that were imposed on European telecommunications through the, the rules that the CCITT imposed back then. There was an organization I used to deal with, uh, was, the acronym was CEPT, some of you may know of it, I know some committee to deal with uh, European PTTs, it was a collection of PTTs. 
and they were not interested at all in going down the path of computer networking. That was Pe that was what Peter had to deal with. I used to think the acronym stood for the Commission to Eliminate Progress in Telecommunications. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but for everything that I saw, and I've talked to Peter about it over the years, he would give me the story from his end, which was completely invisible and often di different. So for example, when we put in the, uh, the satellite node into Goonhilly to enable the SatNet link into, into, into England, um, we got a request from the British Post Office to indemnify them because they didn't know what was going to happen if somebody got electro electrocuted from the equipment or something. And there was no way we could have worked that out bureaucratically on our side. And Peter had a whole uh, approach of his own to resolve that problem and so we would go forward. I'm not going to tell that story for him because I've only heard it secondhand. He knows it firsthand. But you know, the the role that he played in making that happen was truly amazing. Uh, I think uh, the internet would not be what it is today if it weren't for what he did in the, in the international part of it. Worked with everybody. He worked with people in the post office. Uh, he became sort of their surrogate for a while. People in the MOD. Uh, I mean, I had many interactions with uh, John Taylor, who I think was in MOD at the time. Later, I think, uh, ended up uh, after Hewlett Packard Labs in Bristol, went into the SERC for a while. Many, many discussions about it, but it was all hinged on Peter. And that was a very different situation than we had to deal with in the US. So I have another question for Peter, which is actually not about the internet, but it's about uh, how it was when you moved the groups to, from the institution, you know, the Institute of Computer Science to what was effectively the statistics department at UCL. And I used to very much enjoy being in the Pearson building. I know it's historically a bit shady these days, but um, you know, it was quite an amazing thing. Um, but the, was there a cultural difference, you think, being in a stats computing rather than many other computer science departments came out of double E, or sometimes maths, or sometimes even library and information. So I, was, there, was there some special reason that it was statistics, or was that just the, the nice building? It was a nice building, to say. Oh, the reason was simple. It was the only one who would accept us. Characters <laughs> 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 are not quite true. Uh, electrical engineering would have accepted us with the greatest of pleasure, but I then knew uh, the head of uh, of uh, electrical engineering very well. He says his links with us was good enough already. He saw no reason why we should be part of his department as well. Uh, so it was very pragmatic. In fact, the statistics department didn't understand at all what we were doing. I remember being visited right at the beginning by the head of statistics. And he said, ah, well, your staff, is here, and your academic staff is now coming on said, what about my research? Research? They had absolutely no idea. One did that sort of thing. Actually, I remember on the first floor there were mechanical calculators, while in the basement there were LSI 11s. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think you're absolutely right about the balance of uh, what was going on. Well, I should make one comment on that. We were actually the first which tried to use uh, TCP, the, the proper uh, protocols for service. We didn't do that because we wanted to. We suffered a lot in doing it. But my poor little PDP-9s were running out of steam. We needed to run the more modern protocols. So we had to go over for trying to run a real service with protocols which weren't really quite ready for it. It was miserable. <laughs> for the first few months, but at least it gave us experience, which I think was helpful to everybody else later. So there's quite a large audience here, and I'm conscious that some of you may have some questions for our guests here, so please. Uh, yes, Brian. So this is a, I don't know if this will work, but I'm gonna try. Um, uh, I think one thing that's interesting about working in science is that uh, because we, well, many of us are born at different times, you have a sort of blinkered perspective of the way the field looks from when you entered the field and how it maybe changed during your own lifetime. 
And of course, the field existed before your career started, um, and the field changes all the time. One thing I find myself wondering about, I, maybe I'm the only person, I hope not, is you know, how it felt defining the problem to work on, choosing the problem to work on, and then trying to solve the problem in the early days of, say, the ARPANET, versus, say, when Mark and I sit down and look at low latency routing in the context of everything that's come before when at SIGCOM they've now added sessions to get you up to speed on the work that's come before, before you try to hear the paper that's being presented this year. What are the, I mean, we have such a wealth of experience from different eras of internet research here. What are the similarities and what are, the problem is each of you only has your own perspective, but maybe if you speak to one another, what are the similarities and differences about how that felt, how problem choice and problem solving felt in these different eras? Hmm. Shall we start? <laughs> So what, what, one thing, when, I, when I, I moved from UCL, I'm sorry, I had to go to Cambridge again, um, and we have, a, we have a competition in writing uh, names of systems for titles of papers, where we, we win if you find the oldest word, uh, you know, the oldest name, like you know, a word like palimpsest or you know, something. But in the process, one of the things we do is actually a lesson from, from Roger Needham, which is, in fact, he, he said that at least for 10 years after the World Wide Web, people thought there'd been no papers before 1991 too. Um, but in the process of trying to find an old word, for example, I looked up peer-to-peer -peer protocols and I used a quote from the Magna Carta, which is the first occurrence according to the Oxford English Dictionary of the phrase peer-to-peer -peer protocols. Of course, it was used in a different sense. It was the lords and ladies, you know, protocols for establishing who was allowed in court or whatever. But I thought it would be useful. But uh, in, 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 then in that process, I suddenly thought, well, maybe actually I'll look at the protocols they have because maybe they were irrelevant. You know, maybe there were interesting things about trust relationships, for example. So I think um, this is a, a, you know, it's, it's part of process which is, uh, you know, really, it's worth doing old-fashioned kind of library-style research going way, way back. And nowadays, of course, we have taken the archival material and uploaded it thanks to many projects. But, you know, it, it's worth not just looking at the, you know, the last uh, 100, I just read a paper submitted somewhere, I'm not saying where, where the paper cites 150 papers on the topic that this paper is on, um, which, none of which is more than three years old. I'm like, well, this is totally bizarre. <laughs> I don't believe it. But anyway, um, so, you know, the opposite is probably a good plan. Um, but that's just part of process. That's not really an answer to your exact science question. So I probably got the oldest perspective on this of anybody on the panel. But, uh, you know, I mentioned before that when we started the uh, project on internetting, which is what we called it, because there was no concept of internet, it was just an experiment. Uh, the question that was asked more often than not was, what's the application for what you're doing? And of course, the answer was, we just needed to connect these networks for a variety of reasons, like, you know, the radio nets didn't have any computers because they were all in rooms uh, half the size of this with air conditioning. You couldn't carry them around. And so they were all on the ARPANET. So we needed to connect them for some internal technical reasons, but there was no military problem, there was no practical problem that we were actually trying to solve that was larger than that. So if you take it back earlier, at the time I got into networking, to follow up on your question, uh, I was uh, on the MIT faculty in the, uh, the mid-1960s, uh, date me a bit, uh, and I was the youngest one on the faculty, and uh, this was not a compliment, but the fellow who ran the group used to say, you may be the smartest one on the faculty, not a compliment. He says, but everybody else here knows how to make things happen. <laughs> you know, all you know is equations and theory and the like. And you know, just being smart was, you know, not a not a fungible uh, thing at MIT. Everybody was smart. It's so, like you know, everybody on the faculty at UCL is probably smart. So the bottom line was, go find out, do something that shows that you can produce something useful, and then come on back. And so. I got involved in computer networking because I found it interesting. What was my motivation? Nothing more than, I think it'd be interesting to see how you could get a computer to work on another computer. And at the time, most of the people whose views I respected uh, and who were knowledgeable basically said I was throwing my career away. You'll never amount to anything. This is not a problem anybody cares about. <laughs> I mean, there were no laptops, no desktops, no smartphones, nothing that you see today I mean, how many of you 
remember a world without electricity, you know. Some of you may remember a world without, some of you probably young enough to remember a world without the internet, but, you know, back then there was nothing and they, they were all basically saying your career is going to be toast because nobody cares about this. The machines were mostly big batch machines and the few time sharing machines were in universities and they didn't want to share their cycles with anybody and so it wasn't going to lead anywhere and look what happened. So I I think it was Bob Brayton I was talking with a long time back, and he said that when we started out uh, building the internet, we had to kind of have this uh, empty field, and they spent all their time trying to figure out the best path through the field, and since then everybody's been filling in the rest of the field, um, which doesn't necessarily mean that the, the, the solutions since then are better, they're just different a lot of the time. Um, when I started doing networking in the early 1990s, that field was not so full. Um, there, were, there was a lot of stuff that had been done, but there were still whole empty spaces where nobody had really done very much. Um, project with Peter that I worked on first on, on Internet Multimedia um, really was pushing the bounds of what could be done on a packet switch network for, for many years. These days you, you're all watching you know, cat videos, but, um, but back then it was hard. Um, and these days it feels like there's fewer and fewer empty areas to work. But they do come up every now and then. And as a researcher, the real art in, in being a researcher that has um, any impact is to figure out when the time is right for a new part of the field to have opened up. Uh, and understanding that the, the fundamental technology or the way things are used or whatever has, has evolved enough that suddenly there's actually an empty space that just hasn't been done before. Um, and it doesn't happen all the time, doesn't happen very often, but things like space networking or data centers are examples from relatively recent history where a whole new area opened up. There were possibilities which hadn't been done, and we didn't have to be so constrained by what had already been done. We could actually look at different stuff. And so that, I think, is what, what I spend most of my time when I'm looking for problems to solve, doing is trying to figure out whether the world has moved enough in some other area, not usually my own stuff, you know, satellite launch systems or whatever, that suddenly there's a, there's a new place to work which hasn't been done yet and might be exciting. And that's what I'm looking for when I'm looking for problems. So I started at the same time as Mark. Actually, Mark and I shared a basement. Yes, we uh, did. For quite a long time. <laughs> Um, when he a was dungeon. doing neural networks. <laughs> yeah, that was before <laughs> <I> networking. <laughs> That's right, that's not gone anywhere, has it? No. Um, um, and again, in those days we were working on multimedia. I was working on video conferencing with codecs that were big the hardware boxes. boxes. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, there was a lot of difficulty in getting things to work, but also there was a lot of opposition. There were, there were varying views about the way that networks should be. Um, and going back to what Mark was saying earlier about circuit-based and packet-based and things like that, there was an awful lot of debate around that at that point in time. And there were some really very fixed views about the way things should be done. Um, I think there's more flexibility now in view <laughs> than there perhaps was um, back then. Um, but in terms of, of areas to work in, um, as Mark said, um, things, new vistas do open up, but they're not necessarily all in areas where there's an advance in technology. Some of them are areas of application of technologies that perhaps have been around a very long time. So IoT type technologies and what have you are based on MCUs that are 8-bit microcontrollers, 16-bit microcontrollers. Um, and that's old technology. But the kind of scale that we can deploy these things in now and the environments we can deploy them in um, makes it an interesting problem. So it, you know, it's a variety of things, I think, making. Mm -hmm. One thing I remember... Uh, Peter's always been, he just keeps doing these things and one thing he does is he does the thing that I think he knows is wrong as well as the thing he knows is right. So I can think of multiple times where you know you built a network uh, to talk X25 and there were people who remember like John Andrews and people remember that just because you could then say well I told you it wasn't as good as I did. <laughs> and, and I can remember multiple examples of that but it does allow you 
to uh, make the comparison with uh, intellectual honesty because you tried the alternative other people are backing. I think that was very cool. That's, that's a really cool thing to, you know, I think um, when you're doing research, if you take an adversarial view to, of your own work and try what other people say will be better than yours, then you're in a better state, I think. I think that's a, a good way of uh, tackling problems sometimes. And I just remember a lot of times when, uh, when you know, we were coding something that we were going, no, this is definitely not going to work. And, and it would, well, it would kind of work, but not very well. And Stuart actually probably remember this as well. There are other people here who were involved in that. I remember, you know, we kind of, why are we doing this? And in the end, you get a paper out. They said, yeah, no, it, it wasn't as good as the internet. <laughs> right? Am I right? Any comment, Peter? Well, uh, yes, I, I agree with that. But one of the things which struck me recently, we were discussing, uh, there, there was a, a discussion in quite another, uh, another field, in the uh, Internet of Things, and there was a whole day on it. And what struck me was there was absolutely no mention during that day of communications. It was just assumed that communications would work. It was completely embedded now in the infrastructure. So there was absolutely no mention during the whole day that the internet uh, for communications was absolutely fundamental for progress in other fields. And uh, I, that was really what struck me as being the important part of how life had changed completely since those early days. Um, there's a question down here, yeah. Uh, so, so I'm particularly interested, uh, sorry, uh, so I'm particularly interested in Mark Henley's uh, description of, uh, of what had happened to the protocols uh, and the ossification that took place pre precisely because middle boxes were exposed to the contents of packets and precisely because uh, there was a certain degree of flexibility or future-proofing in these protocols. Uh, and I wanted to ask whether, well first, whether uh, it makes sense that, that, that less is more sometimes about what it is that we expose to other, uh, to other potential control points or third parties in the network. Uh, and second, uh, whether this extends beyond uh, beyond uh, internetworking in a data context, but to other kinds of networks as well that we can imagine in other parts of uh, in other parts of human endeavor. Um, so yeah, that's a, it's potentially a very big answer to a very small question. Um, the I think one of the things you have to ask when you when you're talking about the this ossification is why are these middle boxes there? Um, and they're not there just to frustrate protocol designers. Uh, they're there because well, partly because the marketing department of some company was quite good, but they're also there because they actually, to some extent, serve real problems. Um, one of the original design principles of the internet was that any computer should be able to send a packet to any other. We don't actually want that. Um, what we want is some measure of controlled transparency, not complete transparency. There's no reason why my laptop should be able to receive packets from every other computer in the world, including all the malicious ones. Um, I want some measure of protection. And so the, the boxes in the middle of the network that are there for security boundaries are there because probably we got the original design wrong. There was nothing in the original design that made security boundaries explicit. Um, and so we ended up sort of retrofitting them. But in order to retrofit them and have some idea of what's going on, you've got to kind of look within the packets to some degree. Um, so if you eliminated all middle boxes by just encrypting everything end to end, we're right back at the point where we really need to figure out what the security boundaries should be so that not everything should talk to everything else on every surface all the time. Um, and I don't think we've solved that problem yet. But Maybe we'll have to. Um, but at the moment, certainly a lot, a lot of those boxes in the middle of the network are out there because they're serving a real genuine need that we didn't quite understand the security properties of the network we were trying to build. This is not about, this is not about encryption. This is about who can talk to whom, um, which you can implement via an encryptory mechanism, but it's, it's fundamentally about the, the, the architecture of, of the network as a whole. Now, there are lots of other boxes in the network which are there for 
reasons which you can argue whether they're essential or not. But I think the, the concept of some measure of controlled transparency of that end-to-end -end path is a, is a necessary property of a network in today's world, which where it wasn't in the original ARPANET because largely everybody trusted each other. Um, so if, we, if your question is, if we just encrypt everything end-to-end -end and nothing in the middle of the network could see anything at all, uh, I think that then raises some other problems that you would have to solve in such a world that we don't actually have a good handle on how to solve at the moment. Just out of curiosity, Mark, uh, people don't have these kind of protections. So would you think it's a failure of human engineering and design that anybody can talk to anybody? Uh, do people have these kind of protections? Um, people do, but it's, it's based on, on space. Um, but you can walk away and... Presumably a computer can walk away as yeah, well. Yeah, but you can't physically get a, a billion people in the same room as me trying to talk to me at the same time, whereas you can get a billion computers trying to talk to me at the same time. We can have a conversation about <laughs> that too. <laughs> that is an interesting topic. Um, do we have any more questions out there? Uh, oh, right there next. So one of the things that I see is being different from the beginning of the internet to now is that uh, at the very beginning there was almost like, let's show the middle finger to the uh, telecom telecoms companies. <laughs> um, whereas now if you say something new, uh, the question is, why should we deploy something new? Something like content-centric network networking, for instance. So I wonder if you can all comment about that freedom or lack of freedom and what it, what it helps or hinders. Um, okay, so um, obviously the you're, you're asking really about the question of, of difficulty of deploying anything new, um, and the the problem is that as the network moved from being an experiment to being a service to being critical infrastructure, the stakes got higher. So, it, first of all, there's a lot more money involved in just keeping it running. And secondly, there's a lot more depends on just keeping it running. You can't really afford to break the internet. Um, and so this means that the people operating networks have become more and more conservative over the years because the stakes are higher. It's, it's just fundamental with, with the fact that it is now critical infrastructure. The stakes are very high. You can't afford to, to make mistakes. And that means that the, the tolerance for experimentation and therefore the tolerance for new is much lower. Um, and I think that's inevitable. I don't think there's much you can do about that. But the, the other thing I think in behind this question is the sort of us versus them. And when you're starting a research community, it's really nice if you're, you know, you're the, 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 the small guys trying to beat the big guy, you know, the sort of Goliath thing. And um, uh, I remember people at Bell Labs who were starting to work on internet stuff and the rest of AT&T, you know, Bell Labs was a phone company and they said, they're the bellheads and we're doing this new thing, you guys are dinosaurs. And it gives you a kind of special feeling you're fighting against this giant thing, which you can't do now unless, like some people around the world are doing, which is to say, well, why can't we get rid of all these service providers? We, why do we need our SPs and content providers? Why do we need cellular providers? It's to see, re decentralize everything. And there are people doing decentralized ID, decentralized content, peer-to-peer -peer was one of those things. Quite large systems for decentralized social media getting away from the risks of these centralized systems that we see. And I think there's a, a nice fight because those folks think of themselves as, you know, the, the uh, Frodo's of the world, you know, <laughs> go to beat the Dark Lords of the world. Um, and that can be motivated. They may be wrong. Of course, there are many people who set out on those adventures and they're wrong and they lose. But actually, it's motiv it is motivating. So I don't know if we have yeah. a comment. I, I think Mark's comment during his talk about uh, you know, the economic incentives uh, being really important is, is worth uh, focusing on. Um, I think today, anything can get into the net if there's a strong enough economic incentive for it. And it's got to be pretty pervasive because you really have to make global changes. I think the question that comes out of that is that what kind of things can one do now that could ever make it into the net because you've, you know, unless they don't require universal adoption, which is probably means it's a localized kind of phenomenon, then you've got a very difficult challenge uh, at hand. I mean, I've seen any number of papers that talked about you know, the early days of uh, the internet when it was a very large international activity to try and redefine protocols 
they, they, because they wanted the the protocols out of ISO, the seven layer stack, and TP0, TP2, TP4, if you remember those. They never made it, uh, and the argument uh, really was that uh, uh, they would have been much better off coming out of an international forum rather than some research program out of the universities. But, you know, if you think it's really easy to get something started on day one, let me tell you, you have a problem there too. Because on, on day one, when we were trying to get even the ARPANET created, you think it was a no-brainer, it just sort of happened. But if it wasn't for DARPA putting in money, and it wasn't just money for the network, it was money for everything else that caused it to happen. DARPA simply mandated to the universities that it was funding, you will take one of these ARPANET nodes and put it in, we'll pay for the connections. And a lot of the university community was very opposed to it because they said, you know, you're spending all this money on network, and we'd rather have it for our own research. We don't need the net. It was no motivation. But we, um, By the way, we did TP4 over the SatNet just to check it wasn't as good as TCP. There's a paper about it. <laughs> Rob Cole and some other folks. So, okay. Um, yeah. Well, whether it was or not, this was, uh, yeah. it was more political and it was more arm wrestling, but yeah. you can have a problem right from the get-go to get anything new out there that's widely adopted, but I think the general problem that you put on the table is one that's really worth thinking about. So how does one make change? I mean, I remember when NSF was proposing a clean slate internet. You mm -hmm. talked about clean slate in your, in your projects. Uh, clean slate to them meant you wipe out everything. And, and our argument was, no, it really needs to be incremental in some cases, adopted by a small community, a larger one, and if it ever works, it's going to eventually take over. But, I mean, you can't do clean slate earth, right? What does that mean? You don't like the way things are. You've got too much, too much terrorism, political issues. So get rid of everybody, get rid of all the buildings and start over. No, this is uh, un unthinkable, and, you know, incrementalism is really... The way, unless it's something really brand new that nobody's ever seen before, and then you need some organization that can take a lead in pushing it. Mm -hmm. And to be quite frank, if DARPA hadn't taken the lead and had the money to do it, probably would not have happened, certainly the way it did, probably not when it did. And it, it might have happened later on if all the uh, folks in industry got together and saw some universal need for this kind of capability but it would probably look very different than what it is today, and it would probably be dictated primarily by what services the telecommunications industry on their own accord chose to provide. We have so, uh, time for one last question in the back there. Uh, in his talk, Mark mentioned the concept of source routing um, in the context of uh, SpaceX as Starlink. Uh, with the advent of networks like Hyperborea, do you think we will see an increased prevalence of source routing in the broader internet? And if so, how do you think that will manifest? So there's, a, there's an inherent conflict between what the network operator wants their network to do and what the users of their network might want that <coughs> network to do. And so source routing in the public internet has been dead for a long time because the network operator didn't like what people were going to use it for. They would route traffic along paths which didn't make them money. Um, the, the reason I think it makes sense within SpaceX's network is because you're, you're not having the actual hosts and users determine paths. The gateways to the network, whether they're on people's houses or whatever, the gateways to the network might potentially choose a source route through the network. But they're running SpaceX's software. So there's no trust issue there. The, the, there's an alignment of, of interest between what the, the person who wrote the software in that gateway wants and what the network goal is. And so long as those are aligned, source routing is a great technique. But once you get a misalignment of interests, then source, the idea of giving the sources control over paths through the network that conflict with what the network operator themselves want means that inevitably the, the person who's going to win that game is going to be the operator because they're in a more of a position of strength. Um, does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes. Okay. That's great. So, um, Peter, anything that we should have asked you? <laughs> <laughs> Lots of things, I'm sure. Well, the one thing I want to say is I'm so pleased this series started because I was very conscious 
that all the other departments had these sort of uh, lectures, and we didn't. And I very much wanted that we would have them, and that we would have the chance uh, to have this happen. So I really must thank them very much so that we've become now a, a modern department. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope that in the future we broaden to many other areas and stay up to date. And I don't think it'll be purely in communications, but I'm delighted that the series started and thank everybody for making it possible. So I just like to add, I don't think anybody's actually said why we did this today. Oh. <laughs> Do you should, want to add that? Yes, I should say. <laughs> today was a very special day because this was the first day that I actually made a public talk on the fact that this communication existed at all. Nobody knew it at the time. And uh, I, that, that's why I felt also this was a good day to end it, because uh, this was uh, the one year, the, the one day in which one announced that communication was actually possible throughout uh, f between people. Uh, the whole art of the thing was to make it possible for people to collaborate. And quite clearly, th that has succeeded. People are collaborating completely now. And it's now part of the collaborative infrastructure of the world. And from that point of view, we can say we succeeded. Indeed. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for